Welcome to Revive Energy Podcast. You know, we're reflecting this month on our connections and how it, how it impacts us, what communities. Uh, there was this one quote I was just thinking um, as we, nearing the end of February, it, it's, it reads this way. I define connection as energy that exists between people when they feel seen, heard, and valued. When they can give and receive without judgment, when they derive sustenance and strength, from their from the the relationships, Brian Brown. I feel that that re, that reflection, that desire to have that level of connection, is something that I always like to be reminded of. And Re- Revive Ministry tries to take take time, especially this month. A lot of times there's pressures with you know uh, Valentine's Day, but also earlier this month is uh, recognizing World Cancer Awareness Day. You know, reminding ourselves that um, of the struggles that not only the people who are experiencing but all also the families and the the level of connection that is needed to get through that and today we're or having a returning guest um terry thank you so much for coming on and just speaking with us on this idea of connection but also uh inspired by your story of course um thank you again for coming on well, robert thanks for having me on i'm always looking forward to coming back every year and talking with you and uh um you know i always appreciate all my guests i really do appreciate it's not always easy you know finding time we could always say how busy we are how are you busy you know we're we're never okay anymore we're just busy but i do find you know time is so valuable and uh, i do um i do appreciate you terry i want to say a disclaimer for those who are listening if you are in crisis please seek appropriate professional help and you know in the United States, 988 is a suicide crisis lifeline, but wherever you are, I do not like reinventing the wheel. So if it could be a, it could be just a little support group or even a church group or whatever you're involved in, especially as an adult, it's harder to say those three words, I need help. <laughs> especially when you get older, it's harder because, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of context. Like it, We want to have our individual independence, but at the same time, Sometimes it gets to that point where you want to be surrounded by people that you can ask that question. I need help, simply put. Um, I want to ask you, I started out with, always with a quote. It's from Millard Fuller. He says, for a community to be whole and healthy, it must be based on people's love and concern for each other. Uh, I guess in the sense of intentionality, how we, how we go about. I, I used to say this, especially in the church environment. You know, instead of talking about all the nitpicking here and there, let's just call people back. <laughs> let's just call people back. You know, when it comes to that. So, what comes to mind when you hear this quote? Uh, recently, I've had several of the nurses who care for me in the infusion center at the University of Colorado Hospital, where I'm treated for my cancer, recommend different books, and I I spent a lot of time reading books about people who have had near death experiences. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that that I'm taking from reading all these books is that regardless of who you see during your near-death experience, whether whether it's Jesus, whether it's an angel, whether it's a saint, whether it's a family member, the one question that always seems to get asked is, how did you care for my people? Mm. And I I think that's that's so powerful. I mean, we Jesus was asked. You know what's the most important commandment? You know, love the God, have no gods other than us, mm-hmm. other than our one God. And what's the second? Love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah. And I think that's really, you know, in in these experiences, they're not talking about, you know, did you commit? Did you keep the commandments? Were you faithful? Mm-hmm. Did you not commit fraud? Did you? No. It's how did you treat my people? And yeah. I think that goes back to community. How are we? How are we treating each other? If COVID taught us anything, mm. I think it's the value of needing each other. I mean, yeah. during COVID, during isolation, we saw alcoholism rates go up, drug abuse rates go up, mm. domestic violence rates go up. We need each other. We're better together than we yeah. ever are separately. You know, I love the, you mentioned that point, uh, especially of how we treat others. A lot of times when I think about, you know, you know think about the Bible and just, Thought. one notion i like the questions that are prompted we think about the great uh, the good samaritan and those who have read the bible but the the lesson i feel spans whatever background you're in faith or non-faith is 
who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? That is what prompted the whole question about the Good Samaritan and the parable. And I feel a lot of times when we put dividers, it does paint a picture of uh, not uh, being exclusive, not inclusive. How do how do we treat others uh, matters more than we like to admit sometimes. Um, I remember this one, uh, I think it was a Pakistani proverb. It says, um, pride concerns more on who's right while humility concerns on what is right and and i feel a lot of times we think about the who too much and i I love what you mentioned a lot of times it's very simple it's and when it comes to connecting it's not simple to do but to practice because it's every day it's every day you gotta kind of have to be intentional but what's simple is is when we think about how like not focusing on on um, ourselves, but more thinking about how we would like to be treated, how we like to be connect. Um, if we're going to just base it on how people treat us and we base ourselves emotionally, we can get ourselves. Um, I used to say, I could be right, but I could be wrong. I remember this one time when I first got out of the military, I went to support group, Terry, and I was like, the, these people didn't, you know, I was bitter. I was like, I can't relate to these people. Like I was there out there. I had no help. I was struggling with what I was dealing with. But even though it made sense rationally, it made sense maybe it made sense while I was bitter, I was still wrong. I was still wrong. It, it's, it's, it's just how that works. Um, what I want to ask you, what would you say to those who would say that they don't have enough time to connect? You know, I, I know especially when we're thinking about um you know, if we have like um, like a terminal illness or something like that, we may be forced to this position. I need to connect with others. But how the person is like, oh, there's nothing wrong with me. I need to connect. I'm just, you know, I'm doing fine. Um, and, you know, what would you say to them? And why do you think it's important to connect? I, I think you need to look at it from sort of the, the, the end game of it. I remember recently reading a statistic and I, I, in my own life, my, my wife and I have one child, a daughter. Our daughter uh, will be 28 years old this year. She's married. She's in the military. She lives uh, almost on the other side of the country. She lives in Florida. Mm-hmm. And the statistic was 80% of the time that we spend with our children mm-hmm. will be done by the time they're 18 years old. Mm-hmm. And 90% of the time we spend with our children will be done by the time they're 21 years old. So Mm -hmm. I think now, how many more times will I really see my daughter and and her husband? Maybe once or twice a year. Mm -hmm. I've had cancer for 12 years. I'll be lucky to be here a few years from now. So what do I have? Three, four, maybe five more times that I will actually have the opportunity to be with my child. So when you look at it from the end game, you look at it from that Mm -hmm. perspective, all of a sudden, it's like, oh my gosh, yeah. I should be spending a whole lot more time. I should be doing more Zoom calls. I should be mm-hmm. doing more phone calls and saying, hey, what's going on? I, I want to be part of your life for whatever time I have left. So I think if you approach it not from, oh, I'm young, I'm healthy, they're young, mm-hmm. they're healthy, it's not that much of a, de- of a big deal. It is a big deal when you start to look at, in all honesty, how much time you really have to connect mm-hmm. with other people it's not a lot of time you should use that time it's very precious yeah and I, I love how you mentioned just just time is precious let's just let's just say that that in that regards and and if you know a lot of times um it's well, at least with covid I, re, I just remember just the simple little conversations you go to the store i remember mentioned this before and everything was sped up Everyone had their mask on. Everyone was just very, and I'm like, wow, I'm missing something. Even this is the, the daily, how's the weather? How do you know, like these little talk about sports or whatever? Uh, you know, how about the, that game? We didn't have that. And uh, once you lose it, you find that you're missing something. And presence is so important. A lot of times we spend so much time of, you know, I don't know, maybe saying how busy we are, how important things are that we're doing. But ever tried to be more interested in what they're interested in? It's interesting when we talk about connecting. A lot of times it's, you know, we 
we try to put our best feet forward, but a lot of times that best feet forward may be just us listening more, connecting more. We may not understand or maybe not really familiar with certain. That's okay. I feel a lot of times we we lose ourselves because we think we want to say the right things, but a lot of times it's just being present. And I sometimes uh, I think Rachel Rachel Naomi Remen said it nice. She said perhaps the secret of living well is not in having all the answers but in pursuing unanswerable questions in good company. A lot of times, you know, like a lot of people want to speed up the answer. Some of these questions, especially these, these life spanning questions that we kind of get, uh, live deeper um, and learn to live deeper, reflect, take time. It doesn't go over one day and you're like, okay, I get it. And it's nice when you're able to, to I guess, remember that you're human and give you self space to discover this stuff and it's best done with people and i feel like um and that i i don't think it's very and i want to hear your insight on this i don't think it's very i guess depressing to feel how small we are because at the same time it just it just shows how vast everything is and how we could connect with so many people in so many different ways for me, I just feel it's a wonderful opportunity of curiosity and connection that we may be able to have. So, what are your thoughts on all that? Yeah, you, you make a great point. I, and uh, again, I read somewhere recently the difference between perspective and perception. Mm -hmm. You know, we tend to look at life from our perspective. Yeah. And that perspective is based on our experiences, based on our upbringing, based on our education, based on our entire life. Mm -hmm. But if you tend then to shift that, and look at perception, how do you perceive other people to be looking at the same thing that you're looking at, to be, to be looking at life in that regard? If you if you go, we, we tend to say, you know, well, my perspective is this, so everybody's perspective must be that. And that's yeah. not the case mm -hmm. because it's based on everything you've experienced in your life. And we all have different experiences. So flip that around from, Hey, my perspective is this to, mm. oh, Robert, what's, what's your perspective? And you don't have to say this out loud, out loud, but understand where Robert or try to understand where Robert's coming from. Try to understand where another person's coming from. That's the perception part of it. And if you do that, you make those connections. All of a sudden that person is like, oh, this person's trying to understand me. And when I was a, one of the jobs I had in my life, as I was a hostage negotiator on a SWAT team. Mm -hmm. And we used to call that tactical empathy. Mm -hmm. Help me to understand where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. Maybe not necessarily agree with it, mm -hmm. but help me to understand it. And by that person thinking that I am trying to understand them, that builds empathy, that builds trust. And by building trust, in the case of a negotiator, we're trying to get somebody out safely that could potentially be a way to change the behavior of the person we're negotiating with. And a lot of times, you know, uh, the people feeling most marginalized, it really is effective to be able to want to understand them. Like a lot of times um, communities, uh, I would say like um, mental health communities with people with severe mental health issues, people with substance use issues, people with uh, even the LGBTQ community who are struggling just to find what identity they are they don't a lot of times they people don't take the time of day to understand them you, you don't have to always agree with them but you could be with you could be there and i would say a lot of times that does a lot more in connecting in growing and you, a lot of times you know you learn a lot yourself about yourself uh, i learn a lot especially working in, in the field i do and i feel that it's just a it's an opportunity that we try to close the door on because we want to we want life to fit in a little box <laughs> sometimes that like and for me i think when i see kids one of the things i see i have a couple nieces and nephews when i see them the curiosity i feel that's youth like when they have this abundance of curiosity why this they, they're trying to figure out they're trying to figure out and not in a place of how it's just going to be useful they're trying to figure out to the, how is it, what does this mean for me in this world I live in? How does this context matter to me? Uh, I love what Albert Einstein says, and it's a wonderful kind of, he says, I have no special talent. I'm only passionately curious. 
when we're kids, you love it when you know, they're like, who's the best dancer? Everyone. Everyone's the best dancer. Who's the best at singing? Everyone. And like, yeah, you know, we lose that because we're like, well, when you get older, there's you know, obviously growing up, middle school is probably the worst years <laughs> for some people. But, you know, we lose that curiosity because we're trying to define certainty in a little box. But like when it comes to connection, when it comes to these things are intangible and it's not something that we can sometimes fit in a little box. I want to ask you, um, what has helped you, you know, stay connected with those around you? I know you mentioned a little bit and um, and what did not help? I know I like the contrasting um, question. Yeah, that, that's a great question. And I, I'll go back to the, the perspective and perception part of it. I, I am... I'm a curious person by nature. I think that it's incredibly important. And if you if you expand the word curious, I, I always look at it as I want to be a lifelong learner. I, mm -hmm. I want to I want to die learning. And mm -hmm. I think it's important. And 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 I you know when I was a negotiator, we would always get congratulated. It's like you know, great job. You talked that person out. No, what we really did was listen that mm -hmm. person out. So we would ask these open ended questions. We would ask mm -hmm. how and what questions. And I do that. I mean, I spend the bulk of my time, unfortunately, at a hospital. So I have a group of nurses and I've been so fortunate over at least the last three years now, I've been involved you know, in, in their wedding planning, in the birth of their children, in the mm. passing of their parents, in, in the buying of houses. I, I just, you know, hey, what's going on? Tell me about your life. Tell me about how things are going in your life. And mm. whether we like it or not, we're all narcissistic. We all mm. love talking about mm -hmm. ourselves and how, you know, how our life is. And I, I used to tell my wife when we would go, you know, to her holiday Christmas party and mm. things like that uh, with her companies. I said, now I'm going to go in here and I'm going to find five people and I'm going to ask them all about themselves. And I said, when I come out, I'm going to tell you all about those people. Mm -hmm. And I said, when you go back to work Monday morning, they're going to come to you and they're going to tell you what a great guy I am, but mm -hmm. they're not going to be able to tell you a thing about me mm -hmm. because I would go in and I would like, well, where did you go to school? How did you meet your wife? Tell me about your kids. Mm -hmm. And we love talking about that stuff. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is they would never reciprocate. Well, mm -hmm. how did you meet your wife? Where did you go to school? Tell me yeah. about your children. Yeah. They would yeah. never do that. And so by doing that, they think I'm a great guy because I, you know, I'm asking them all these questions about them. And my wife it used to drive my wife nuts. Mm -hmm. And I'd get in the car on the way home. I was like, all right, here's here's about Bob. Here's about Sally. Here's mm -hmm. about Tom. Here's about... And then Monday morning, these people would come into her office and be like, you know what? Your husband's a great guy. And, like, <laughs> and you don't know a thing about him because you never bothered to ask. It's We love talking about ourselves. You want to be a great conversationalist or have people think you're a great conversationalist? Just ask people about themselves and yeah. then shut up. Don't say a word. Yeah. Just let them talk. Yeah, I, I you know, I I feel um, another aspect. Even looking at the same model is especially communities I work in is um, just humanizing people again. Like there's so much dehumanizing when we don't understand something. It's it's this dualistic approach. You're either with me or against me. You know, but a lot of times I feel that's. Um, at least for me, like being curious like yourself, there's always like a third option. We always forget about. There's always that third option that we're, we're just like, no. Um, the third option is that I could be wrong or partially wrong. Maybe this person has a good point. Or maybe it's okay to not agree with things and be friends with people. Because the thing is, we all have different contexts like we're bringing up. We grew up in different cultures. We have different values. Does that does that make me more important than you? No, not necessarily. Like in, in that context, if we're and, and I feel a lot of times because of that kind of competitiveness, communication gets lack. They get lackluster. You know, as easily as you mentioned, you just ask questions. It shows more about the lack of communication when someone could get so pulled away by someone just asking about them. Simply put. It just shows what kind of people are around us every day. There, it's sometimes I, I, it makes me a little sad when I see younger, eight, you know, 18, 19 year olds. They're like walking commercials about things that they want. Like, and I ask them, why do, why do they want to do this? 
And literally, I feel like I'm watching a commercial. And I'm like, but how about you? Do you really want to do this? I think there's an allure of belonging and a lure of, uh, of, of, um, how you say, not being surprised, having some sort of control. But a lot of times, I can imagine, as you, you, you shared before, sometimes there isn't control. Sometimes there isn't, and that's the harsh reality. So we try to make these kind of um, notions. I'm going to do this. You could work out, eat right all your life, and still have a terminal illness. It could happen. And then you're like, well, I did everything right. And then you, these are where the deeper questions start coming in. And as you mentioned before, I want to, um, I like to, uh, I'll um, give a moment for you to kind of share a little bit about, more about like maybe an update for those who are listening. Um, how are you doing, Terry? And is there anything else you want to share? Uh, as we, And then we'll continue on. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, Robert. Uh, I am... I'm continuing to remain stable. I have been on a clinical trial drug now uh, mm -hmm. for the tumors that I have in my lungs for a little over three years now. The trial ended about a year and a half ago. My doctor was fortunate enough to get me uh, to be, I'm a single person trial. I, I'm, I'm one person continuing to mm -hmm. do this. And, and I feel great from my perspective. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. everybody who was on the trial with me when it started three years ago has passed away. And mm -hmm. I am still here. I, and I, I know I'm here for a reason. I remember when I had my, found out I had these tumors in my lungs, it was the same time I ended up having to have my leg amputated because mm -hmm. of my cancer. And about six months after all this occurred, my oncologist was showing me my CAT scan. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't, I have no medical background. I don't know how to read a CAT scan. But you can mm -hmm. kind of look at it and be like, oh, well, that sure doesn't look like it belongs there. You know, mm -hmm. I these big tumors in my lungs. I had fluid all around the space, the plural spaces in my lungs. And I remember looking at my oncologist and saying, how was I alive? And Robert, I'll never forget this. He put his head down, he shook his head no. And then he lifted his head up and he looked at me and he said, I don't know because you shouldn't have been. Mm -hmm. Which said to me that God's not done with me yet. You know, when mm -hmm. I die, where I die, how I die, way above my pay grade, I spend mm -hmm. more time focusing on as we're talking about the connection that I can make with other people so that my life can be enriched and I can enrich their life with the discussion, with the connection that we have. So I am still stable. I'm continuing to, to be treated every three weeks at the mm. hospital uh, for an entire week. And I will do that either until the drug stops working uh, or my doctor says we've got another type of therapy. So I'll mm. continue to do this. It's, it's not a fun thing, but it allows me the opportunity to come on here and talk with you every year. And we're very grateful for that. I know, I, I you know, I'm each. It was just so wonderful when we we uh, had um, I had my wife actually reach out to you and like set this up, and I'm, I'm like, oh, yes, yes, we could, we could, like for yeah, obviously, you know, be, speaking frankly, you know, I'm, um, I'm always wondering, you know, obviously, it's 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 there, you know. It's not being insensitive. It's just, you know, I just, you know, I value the connections I get in this podcast. You know, for me, I think you have an inspiring story that a lot of people don't have that vantage point because they're thinking about like they're stuck. They feel like they're stuck and they're, they're, there's no, and it's, it's inspiring to kind of see the bigger picture. Step back a little bit. What's really important? You know, is it important to, seem like you're better or actually say uh, i'm gonna put some boundaries here i'm gonna start spending more time with my family um this stuff matters to me uh, if the work is not working out if the people are not respecting your time or maybe maybe taking steps to find something more appropriate for what your life really demands and uh, i think sometimes we put unreasonable guilt or unreasonable pressure um and we don't stand up for what's important and when you see when people I, I like to hope that people when they hear this and they see you and people like yourself they're like hey wait a minute I, I do have a choice I do have a choice to kind of improve like yeah maybe I'm here right now but maybe I don't have to stay here maybe I start I could start trying to connect with people that maybe I burned bridges but you know it's still today there's still today and there's still tomorrow and maybe a long road to get to that 
level of connection. But if I think if we're kinder to the problem taking longer than we liked, um, I think I think I think it can really help us be motivated to connect in in that manner. I, I want to ask you, uh, what has been a the biggest lesson you've learned or are learning when it comes to connecting with those around you, family, friends, nurses, what has been really a big lesson for you? It, 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 it is having that connection because I think cancer or any kind of a chronic or a terminal illness, it doesn't necessarily have to be cancer, tends to isolate you. You know, I yeah. think first you get isolated from your friends, then from your family, mm -hmm. and then towards the end, you get isolated from yourself. So having that connection, it's, it's almost like a lifeline for me. It's, mm -hmm. it's being around people that, well, my life may not be the greatest. It, I'm not feeling good, whatever it is. I can vicariously live through other people. You know, to, mm -hmm. hey, you just had your, your baby. Show me pictures of your baby. Mm -hmm. oh, you saw that happened over the holiday. Show me your wedding photos. You know, tell me about the new house you bought. Now I'm able to get into life that's what life is about these interactions mm -hmm. and things that, that we have with each other and by asking them i mean again we love sharing that kind of stuff it's great mm -hmm. stuff you want to share the positive but i've also been involved with some of especially my nurses with you know my parent died or i had to put my parent into a, a nursing a, an extended care facility because they're, they're losing their memory and things like that it's a difficult things as well G giving I, I can't tell you how many times i have literally cried with my with my nurses where we were talking about either something that affected me or something that affected them mm -hmm. and i always is no matter how lousy i feel physically i always come out of those sessions feeling immensely great immensely grateful just for mm -hmm. that connection i have with that human being for whatever that that hour or two hours that we get to spend together yeah and you know i just you mentioned like it's it's great to have those positive times all those positive moments but also like especially i just noticed and for me it, like most people they want to have answers like if someone's struggling with something you want to be able to say reassure them but what happens if there's nothing to reassure what do you do then and what i learned especially um in my life and also working in the field i do is just being present like listening to them you know and the funny thing is most times and this is what i learned is they don't expect you to have answers they just love that you're there willing to understand their perspective like you said the understanding why this matters why it's hard to see my mom let's say in, in context um go through dementia and alzheimer's how i feel like um sometimes i feel she's there and sometimes she's not or like in another avenue Ah, uh, you know, whatever, especially right now, homelessness is rising. People are being homeless for the first time ever because of many different factors. And to assume that whenever you walk in the street and you see someone homeless, be like, oh, they've been that way for a while. is not so much true anymore. Um, it's um, this. The rates are staggering in the United States, how much homelessness have increased. Some will say, well, you know, some of them choose that way, not necessarily, you know, and a lot of times, well, um, it's because of drug use. Yes, but also it's also resources. It's also family. Sometimes I'll just tell you honestly, Terry, I look, I talk to people in front of me who are struggling and I would, I'm thinking in my head, how the hell are they alive? How are they alive right now? Why? Like the, the fact that they're still fighting is inspiring. They don't see it themselves. They're just like they're just in the thick of it. They're like, all this has happened to me. I'm like, but you're here asking for help. How many people are out there not asking for help, trying to grind through it? So I, I do find, at least for me, the biggest lesson I learned is you know, is not feeling like you need to have all the answers when it comes to connecting. It, it, feeling like you don't have to have a relatable scenario situation i don't have to say oh i have a uncle who had cancer i don't have to say any of that i just have to be there i just was like how are you feeling i like what's going on well like be present and and i feel a lot of times we miss the mark we're like oh because 
we have some relatable market that doesn't always guarantee a connection a lot of times it's really about humanizing the person who may not feel like very much like a human because they've been either like you said isolated or just feeling isolated that is enough so um the support might be there but it's hard to feel it when you're feeling that way anything you yeah. want to add yeah i i i'm thinking of a story what i think all i'm going to tell you today is nursing stories but here's another <laughs> one so, um when i initially met this particular nurse she was already a nurse she was about 25 years old but she was being preceptive learning how to do the things in the unit where i get treated and about six months later she was taking care of me by herself and she came in to my room during the treatment she said terry i've got a story i want to tell you but I'm a little uncomfortable telling it to you. Mm -hmm. And Robert, I was like, I, I don't know how to respond to that. I was like, well, I, I hope you decide you want to tell me the story. I bet I would really enjoy hearing it. And so she's in and out over the next couple hours and finally comes in, sits down. And she's like, all right, here's what I want to tell you. She said, when I first met you, I was going to get out of nursing. I had a very good friend of mine that had recently died. I was in a really dark place. I talked to my family. I was going to get out of nursing. And I was going to go to work for Amazon. And she said, and then I met you and I see what you go through. I see the physical uh, side effects that your medication gives you when you're here all the time. And then I went back in your chart and I, I read everything you've been through during these 12 years. And she said, when I finished reading your story, I knew I was where I was supposed to be. Now, if she would have never told me that story, mm -hmm. I would have had no idea that my life had had a positive impact on her. I can promise all your listeners, there's somebody out there. You may know them, you may not know them, mm -hmm. but they're watching how you handle your struggles, how you handle difficulty, how you handle adversity. They're learning from you. And some of them would give almost everything they have just to walk in your shoes for five minutes. Mm -hmm. So don't think that your, your circumstances are nobody cares, nobody notices. I can promise you people notice and people are looking at how resilient you are and how courageous you are in fighting your battles. Yeah, I, 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 I feel that's a lesson that I keep learning because you know it's it's it also shows the accountability and responsibility each one of us has. Um, it's not that I'm going to have all the answers. It's it's like what we started in the beginning. It's how I treat. I have a bad day. Doesn't mean that this person caused my bad day. I'm human. You know, a lot of times people say, I don't, I don't know how to help people. I don't have time to help people. I say, you go to a restaurant, be kinder, <laughs> they get yeah. your stuff wrong. Be kinder to them. That is, it's that simple. Uh, a lot of times you don't know uh, how much of an impact you just saying, oh, it's okay. You know, they, you could see they're new or they're just struggling. Maybe it's a very busy people didn't show up to work. Restaurants a tough business. And I'd like to use that as an example because a lot of times people don't realize how much pressure they have in there as a waiter as so if you go to you had a bad day at work you spilling it on to them saying how did you get this wrong you know as opposed to saying hey this person might have had a hard time because politely to say hey this was wrong or whatever it makes a big difference it makes a big difference how we treat one another and how we connect and, and i feel that sense of responsibility is something i could I have to keep reminding myself i cannot be like okay this is okay to be kind here but not over here it goes back to the whole who is my neighbor it's everyone it's how we treat everyone i want to ask you as we go to the, our final thoughts what do you why do you think it's important to set aside time to improve our connections i say this suggestively because i know for me i need to set aside time to actually think about these things because we could get Especially the world we live in, we could be very, we could get really caught up. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I, I think it's important to humanize our relationships. You know, in the scenario you were talking about, you know, with a waiter or a waitress that got an order wrong, use their name. I mean, yeah. that was one thing we were taught as negotiators. I'm not going to try to negotiate with somebody that's barricaded with a gun or has hostages and say, hi, I'm Sergeant Tucker. No, I'm mm -hmm. going to say, hi, I'm Terry. Mm -hmm. What's your name? Yeah. Humanizing that relationship, understanding that I want to understand, again, maybe not agree, but I want to understand where you're coming from. I, yeah. I, want to, I want to be in your life. I care about you 
as a human being. And we're so caught up in ourselves. We're so caught up in our day-to-day -day life. I, I remember, um, you, and you'll probably remember Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. He educated so many young people, including me, on public television when I was growing up. In 2003, Fred Rogers died and his family was going through his effects and they found his wallet. And inside his wallet was a scrap piece of paper on which Mr. Rogers had written four simple words. Life is for service. I love the quote from Mother Teresa that says, God never asks us to be successful. He asks us to be faithful. And what is being faithful? Faithful is connecting with the people around us, connecting with our God. If you do those things in life, I promise you, your life will be so much richer. It will be so much better. It will be so much more amazing than if you try to do it by yourself. Nobody gets to the top of the mountain alone. Mm -hmm. The road to success is paved with failure. You're going to make mistakes along the way. But as long as you learn from those mistakes, mm -hmm. your life is going to continue to grow. You're going to be more curious. You're going to be a lifelong learner. And at the end of your life, you're going to be able to say, man, what a ride. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I feel it, it, you know, a lot of times it's the micro decisions we make each day that matter. Although we think about these big pivotal moments. I, uh, I am going to quit, let's say quit smoking, you know, or whatever. Um, but what are the micro decisions that you made each day that led you to that? Or what is the micro decisions that make you say, I want to reconnect to some family member that we lost contact. And it, it's, it's getting up each day. It's, it's saying to yourself, you know what? Um, I don't like how this feels. And like, I think emotions are always has gets a bad rap, Terry, because <laughs> emotions are not, well, not things to be led by, but they're indications that things may need to change. So if I'm angry, doesn't mean I'm bad, it's bad to be angry. So I'm angry. Something has to change. What, what bothers me so much about this? Think deeper. If you think deeper and like you mentioned, if you learn from it, there's, there's nothing's wasted. You know what I mean? Nothing's wasted in that regard. So I feel when we think about it as, as a long problem that can, will, will, will change in time, sometimes you'll have it right, sometimes you don't have it right. We're both, as human beings, impressive and unimpressive at the same time. We're one of those people, you know? But at the same time, if we're kinder to ourselves and in the idea of what, how long things take and how things are valuable, like you mentioned time. If the time is valuable, we will make time. If people are valuable, we will make time for those people. This is one of those things. But when we dehumanize, when we do these things, we try to we try to box in so it, it, we could manage our time better. But we end up not managing it at all. We end up just trying to, uh, in a way, find a, 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 a solution to a problem that will continue to kind of change each day as we live. So I, I do like the model of, as my final thought of um, just, you know, in, in Italian, there's this one proverb, if I'm not going to live long, I live deeper. So deeper, think about things deeper. So time is short, whether you have in perspective, just like you mentioned in the beginning with, you, you know, you have kids when they turn 18, 80% of your time with them is that eight from when they were born to 18. Remember that every connection, every, you know, is is invaluable. And like you said before, people are looking at you. People are. And so I, I do feel a sense of responsibility and accountability. But that accountability is nothing to, uh, I feel pressure. It's just something to humble myself because I know that each of us do matter to each other. Any final thoughts you want to mention as we wrap up? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you one more story. Again, another nursing story. <laughs> so, I, I, I had a nurse recently who was taking care of me, asked me what it was like to have my foot amputated in 2018 and then my leg amputated in 2020. 20. And I told her, I said, it, it certainly hasn't been easy. I'm, I'm six foot eight inches tall. So learning to walk again, falling is not an option. You mm -hmm. kind of get hurt from this height. Mm -hmm. So I have to be a little more careful. But what I told her was, Cancer can take all my physical faculties, mm. but cancer can't touch my mind, it can't touch my heart, and it can't touch my soul. And Robert, we spend a tremendous amount of time 
you know, focusing on working on this body. We we work out, we eat right, we get enough ex or we get enough sleep, we reduce stress. And I'm certainly not telling you not to do that. You absolutely should continue to do that. But what I am suggesting is this: maybe spend a little more time every day working on who you really are, your heart, your mind, and your soul. We know this body's going to die at some point. It's going to decay and it's going to go away. But your heart, your mind, and your soul, I believe those things are eternal. Those things live on. And I just don't think we spend nearly as much time working on them as we should. I just want to say it's always a pleasure to have you, Terry. Thank you so much for just sharing your insight. It's, you know, it's one of those things that if we're kind enough to realize that these problems, these these things that we're understanding and realizing will take time. I think, I think I, I feel that it, it has the more potential of success in the sense that I know that me understanding who I am and what that means will ever change. But if I'm, if I'm kind and, and continue to value myself and the time that I have around it, uh, then those micro decisions will be easier. So it'll be like, just like you mentioned, uh, I want to be around to be with my wife, live a long life. So that means I will try to take care of myself, my body, but also my mind. Um, if I have an argument with my wife or with a friend, I'll just like, I don't be like, oh, I'll just figure itself out. No, I'll talk you through what's going on. And uh, that extra energy may seem unnecessary because life is telling you this, oh, you, you, this pace. But the pace is only on you. You you dictate that pace. So if if it's important to you, I love what you mentioned. Remember their names. You know, I, I do feel there's such a human element when you when a person has a child. They spend a lot of time naming that child. That 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 human aspect. That why a lot of times these 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 mental health substance use all these things maybe things especially the generation behind me don't understand but they understand the person I, I you know I don't understand depression I don't understand all this stuff but I love my nephew I love my son I love my daughter and I want to support and help them the best I can and I think when we go to the derivative of our feelings and we work and we connect better i think a lot of it can really help each other in that regard and again thank you so much terry i want to tell those who are watching remember to stay updated with revive Mission through various platforms revive mission is our website this is goodbye from revive Mission podcast leading with this last book from coretta scott king the greatness of a community is most accurately measured by the compassionate actions of its members